Have you been scrolling through many, many, many film podcasts thinking there's far too many of these? Or have you been thinking there's something missing? There's something we're not quite getting. A waffler from Northern England reviewing films, for example. Welcome to oh, Review It Yourself. No politics, no pandering, no point. Welcome to Review It Yourself. So, we're going to be reviewing Twister, the 1996 film. So, the film starts off in June 1969. There's an F5 tornado, which is the one of the highest categories you can get. It's F1 or F6. And you see Jo, she's a little girl um, with her mum and dad and kind of a farmhouse in Illinois, I believe it is. And there's a massive tornado coming. The race across the garden. Stuff's flying about all over the place. They get into the, obviously, the storm shelter. But then, obviously, the dad's essentially ripped away. He tries to hold the door shut and the bolts blow out and he's ripped away and killed. <clears throat> the mum, funnily enough, I recognise because she has a role in, the perf- in A Perfect Storm, which I think... When did that come out? The year before? 95, I think. Uh, that's not the point, anyway. Um, and then, obviously, it goes straight to the present day, and it shows a satellite and the Earth in CGI. And I thought, oh, my God, the CGI is awful. Absolutely awful. Like, shockingly so, even for the 90s. But it turns out to be able, like a weather monitor. But it's still pretty bad. Um, and this monitor is at the NSS. L, N S S L. It's not easy to say. That's the National Severe Storm Laboratory, or laboratory. Or, um, and obviously at this laboratory, uh, <laughs> at this uh, laboratory, at this lab, um, well, basically they're there. The scientists are there, and they're looking at the screens and monitoring all the data and saying pretty much right that this could go really badly. There could be, a, you know category of tornado we've never seen before so and then it goes to this idyllic um part of illinois and you see kind of a plane flies over <coughs> excuse me there's like crop dusting a plane flies by it's really idyllic beautiful and then you see bill paxton in a car in, well in like a truck with his t- t- turns out to be his fiance uh he's he is sporting a fantastically 90s haircut it's like smart at the front and then high at the back i would say it's like muller-esque but it's not that low at the back and they're basically talking and his fiance is saying you know you're going to get it to sign the papers that's what we're here for and then they pull up and you find out him and his soon-to-be ex-wife if she signed the papers the divorce papers uh are storm chasers He's obviously like a weatherman now. You don't see him doing that, though. And, you know, there's, you see the other people. There's uh, Alan Rook. There's Philip Seymour Hoffman. So it's a great cast. And obviously you find out Bill Paxton's um, character's called Bill. So that's easy for him to remember. And Joe is played by Helen Hunt, who is, plays Tom Hanks' wife in Castaway. She's done other things, but that's what I remembered her for. And you've got also Jeremy Davies is one of the storm chasers as well from Saving Private Ryan. He's kind of the translator, translator guy in that. Um, and then, you know, he's, he's trying to build Santa, Santa Joe, look, if you signed the papers, and she's sick, she just cuts him off and he's like, Dorothy's here. And he's like, oh, where? And I was thinking, oh, do they have a daughter? Like, That's a bit strange. Well, not strange, but I'll... anyway, it doesn't crop up before then. And he says, I want to see it. And I thought, it? It's a bit weird. And then it turns out to be the Dorothy's this machine that they've designed together and then she's eventually built that essentially what it does is it, it has all these little sensors in like plastic s- spheres. The, the idea is to put this Dorothy machine, which is like a big, big, 
uh, canister, maybe the size of kind of a a garbage, like an uh, like a good god, get your words out, man, like a garbage, a trash can, a garbage can, you know, a, a bin, got there in the end. And, you know, the, the lid's going to flip up and all these sensors are going to fly up into the tornado and all swell around and they're going to get all these different readings from it. And she says to him, oh, we've built four of them. And you find out from the other guys that Bill's nickname is The Extreme. They all have, they all have nicknames. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's Dusty. And it is quite as hilarious. He, they're, just, they're all absolutely nuts. They're all absolutely... Well, I mean, you'd have to be a little bit, well, a little. You'd have to be eccentric to go chasing after tornadoes to put your, you know, your life on line like that. And then we meet Jonas Miller, who is well, Bill calls him a, a night crawler, and he's basically their, their four, you know, their rival, if you like, and he's essentially ripped their idea off and built something very similar. And. But as Bill says, he's you know he's he's fancy. He's got fancy toys, and but he's got no instinct, you know. And you see this throughout the film. And to be fair, Carrie, I can never pronounce his last name. Carrie Ellis, or he, the guy who uh, plays Doctor Lawrence Gordon in Saw, he's also in Liar Liar as uh, Jerry, and. He, he, no one does slime like him. He, he's really good in this film. He has what my friend would call a cack eating grin. And if you don't know what cack is, well, anyway. Um, so Bill's got some edge. His character's got a bit of edge. He sees that, you know, this guy's ripped off his idea and he's, he's fuming about it and, you know, tries to fight with him, but he's obviously held back. And then. I did like that. I like the fact his character had a bit of edge because up until then he's kind of quite quiet and he's just, well, he's not quiet, but he just wants this these papers signed and wants to get out of there. And I was thinking, oh, this guy's a little bit browbeaten. And then it turns out he's he's not. He's really got a lot about him. And the his fiance at the beginning, I was thinking she was being played as not being particularly smart, but then you figure out obviously she. I think I was thinking, oh, she's a psychiatrist because you hear her on the phone to like one of her clients and she's a therapist. As he puts it, uh, a relationship or reproduction therapist, I think he says. Um, and she obviously she's not daft. She knows that that uh, Helen Hunt's still in love with Bill. Or Joe's still in love with Bill, she knows. And obviously Bill just slots right in. There's tornadoes popping off all over the place, as luck would have it. And... Bill just slots right into it and they keep saying to him at the, at the beginning, oh, it's not great to have you back. And he's like, I'm not back. I'm not back. I'm just here to get these papers signed. But he, he slots right back into it. You can see it's what he lives for. Or what he did live for before. And, you know, they have a bit, Bill and Joe have a bit of a chat and she says, oh, you know, your fiance, she, you know, she's nice. And he, he's obviously like, well, what do you mean? You know, they have a bit of an argument while they're driving. To to obviously they're chasing this this tornado because they try they want this new machine to work so that that's kind of the the pace in the film is very quick so that's the challenge throughout that they've got four chances essentially they've got four of these Dorothy machines the other guy's got one and he basically that it's a chase to see who can get this in the track in the path of a tornado not get killed and then get all this data because they'll be the first ones in history to do this. And then the the group is a real ragtag group. They go to her aunt May's house, and that's Joe's aunt May, and she feeds them. I think it's steak and mashed potatoes and stuff like that. And you see the group's real ragtag, but but they don't look like a lot. But you can tell they really know what they're doing. Alan Rook's character is kind of the navigator. He, he's got all the maps. Obviously, they're all paper maps. There's no sat navs at this point. And he's basically saying, no, we're going this way. And he's because he has to find them shortcuts. And you see Carrie, um, his character, who's kind of very, well, he's not scientific. He, he's just very much very standard by the, oh, what does this say? What does the system say? Whereas 
Bill and Joe's group, they can look at the sky and they can feel the wind and all that kind of thing. They, they work it out that way. And they talk when they're at the house having, you know, the dinner, they talk about the Fujita scale, which is the, so the F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, which is described as the finger of God. Um, although I have read there was apparently a category F6 in America, but it's somewhat disputed by scientists. Anyway, and, you know, they, they try and get, I think they tried twice and they, they've, you know, they fail and they almost get killed, Joe and Bill. By a turn of they almost get killed and he has to drag her away at the second attempt because he doesn't think she's going to leave and she's going to get killed. And basically, you know, they, they get hit by hail and all sorts. And he basically says to her, you know, look what you've got right in front of you. And he's like, me, you've got me. And obviously they're all connected by radio. So his fiance hears this. She knew anyway, she's not daft. And she, in the end, leaves and they go, the group go chasing this massive F6 tornado, uh, F5 tornado. And they succeed in getting this machine to work. In the meantime, they go and save Aunt Mayor's house because it's it's destroyed. I think it's, is it Wakita that the tornado rips through? Apparently they bought, they bought a section, the production team, they bought a section of Wakita and like so many houses and just destroyed them. Well, obviously made them look like a tornado had been through. And the set design was absolutely outstanding. And the sound effects were awesome. The, there was a use of kind of, I wasn't expecting, it was very action-packed film. You know, Jan de Bont, the director, who directed Speed and Speed 2 Cruise Control. With Speed, he directs a film well when he does things at speed, when it's, no pun intended, when he does things quickly, you know, and it's very fast paced. I think that was one of the problems with Speed 2 Cruise Control. And obviously it's written by Michael Crichton of Jurassic Park fame and his wife. And it's, it's a good film. It really is. Carrie, Carrie's character gets killed because he doesn't, he doesn't listen to the tram one. And, you know, it's going to shift. They can, they can sense it. They can see it. Whereas his scientific instruments can't predict what's going to happen. Well, nobody can. And he gets killed. Which they obviously they gutted about. I'm not the other, you know, they are genuinely well angry about it more than anything. He doesn't listen to them. So it, it was a good film. It, to be fair, for a film that's getting, I think it's one hour forty nine minutes or something like that. For an hour that's that for a for a film that's that long, it it whistled by quite quickly. A little bit like this review because it, you know, it is very much a, a good popcorn film. It's well made. The CGI stands up quite well. The action set pieces are great. I heard Jan de Bont, well, I read Jan de Bont pick to do this film because he thought it would be one of the last times that the practical effects would be used rather than total CGI effects because they could see how CGI was progressing. A little bit like James Cameron and that production team when they made Titanic in, in 1997. And they said, you know, we used to make things for real. Whereas, you know, you, you've just got to look at the Marvel films and the films that come out now where it's it's a rarity if, if something's done practical. I think the only person really doing it, well, not the only person, but the most well-known doing it is Christopher Nolan. He still does things for real and he gets the results for them. I didn't think which tenant, but, you know, I'll let him have one. I'll let him have one dud. <laughs> no, it, it was it, it needed raining in a little bit, I felt, tenant. Just somebody needed to say to him, you know, Chris, this is this great idea, but we we actually need a little bit of story in it. We need not a story. We need a little bit of, you know, we need some characters. We need somebody to root for. We don't have that. You can't just have things happening because who, who cares? You know, who cares? You know, I mean, Inception. Inception's a complete, you know, mind, you know, scrambler. But. It has like a really, really good story throughout it. You know, as he killed his wife, what's happened with his wife. And, you know, whereas Tenet doesn't have that. Anyway, I digress. So, yeah, it was it was, it was was a good film. I enjoyed it. It wasn't bad. It was a good popcorn film. Uh, 
twister. You know, I, I I wouldn't mind watching it again on a on a rainy day when I just want something, you know, fun just to stick on and enjoy. But, you know, it's not bad. Bill Paxton's good in it. Yeah, it was all right. The more I think about it, the more, you know, it was it wasn't bad. So that was a bit of a quick whistle to whistle stop review there. Yeah, it wasn't bad. I'm just trying to decide what we're going to return with for the uh, the next episode. I think you'll just that'll just have to be a surprise. So thank you for joining me on this uh, rather quick review, and I'll catch you soon.